Can you imagine what it would be like if there wasn't love? Can you picture what life would become? Without love, there'd be no compassion, no comfort, no peace. Without love, there'd be no caring, no giving, no kindness. Without love, we would be consumed by selfishness and filled with arrogance. Without love, grace would have never been offered. Mercy would have been unimaginable. When you add love to the equation, everything changes. Love is patient. Love is kind. Not envious or prideful. Love puts others before ourselves. Chooses peace over anger. Love protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Love changes everything. Wesley Church. Good morning. Good morning to everybody here in person. Good morning to everybody joining us on live streaming. I'm so glad to have you join us for worship this morning. There's so much going on in our lives and in the world this week. Please take this time to breathe. Close your eyes. Feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. God has called you here today for worship. Open your heart to his message for you today. And I pray that if you hear anything today, you hear that God loves you, and so do we. Let us prepare for worship this morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. You have executed justice and righteousness among your people. Please remain standing as we continue to worship God with songs of praise. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Our Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides our needs. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Praise the Lord, everybody.
shine And out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Sing our God For our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power of God, our God. For our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, He's awesome and power of God, our God. If our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop? Voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. If 
every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. God of imagination, we thank you for creating us in your image and granting us with your creativity that we might experience wonder and beauty in this life. Grant us the power to break down the lies of self-doubt, break through the social barriers of separation, and break free into your hope-filled future. Lead us now into the transformed world you promise in your scriptures. In the name of the risen Savior, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God is good all the time. And all the time. God is good. 
Amen. And God is good. I'm so glad to be back. Uh, so glad to be back. Oh, you. I was not looking for applause, but thank you. Thank you, though, Troy. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, once again, good morning. My name is James Lee. I'm the pastor here at Wesley United Methodist Church. If you hear anything today, know that God loves you, and so do we. I'm so glad that you're joining us for worship today. Uh, if you are new here, I'm going to invite you to fill out the I'm New Here card. They're the blue cards that look like this in the pews. Uh, just put your name and one way to contact you, and we uh, will just reach out to you this week for you to get to know us, for us to get to know you. Maybe we'll grab a cup of coffee. Who knows? Fill out this card and just put it right in the offering plates in the back, and we will love to get in touch with you this week. Also, now's a great time to fill out the red fellowship pads. Uh, just These are in each of the pews. Just put your name, pass it down, uh, make sure we all fill it out. This is our way of remaining connected as a church family. So please go ahead and fill that out uh, at this time. Thank you. Just want to share a few announcements this morning. So uh, this week starts Lent. Lent is a 40-day season uh, as we prepare for the passion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. It is a time where we uh, enter into a time of uh, reflection, and we uh, oftentimes, some people like to give something up for Lent as a way of growing in their spiritual disciplines and in their faith. Uh, that is your choice. What would you like to do? But it is a time where we come together and draw closer to God as we prepare for the resurrection. Um, so this Wednesday is the beginning of Lent, and we have an Ash Wednesday service here at our church at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we are doing something special. We are joining together with Christ United Methodist Church in Piscataway. So they are going to be joining us here at our church uh, to do the Ash Wednesday service together. And Reverend Ronell Howard will be speaking at that service. So uh, we invite you to come join us this Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. and uh, as we begin the season of Lent together. Also next week, we are starting a, a new sermon series uh, titled, Do You Believe? And uh, I invite you to just turn, pay your, turn your attention to the screen as we watch a quick trailer. Take a listen. Jesus' power was displayed through miracles, healing the sick, freeing the oppressed, restoring the broken, and resurrecting from the dead. But did you know that Jesus' miracles still happen today? Healing still happens in our midst, and freedom is possible, and restoration from all the things that are broken, restoration is ours, because resurrection brings new life. Do you believe in miracles? So if you look at your... Uh uh, bulletin insert, you'll find two sheets of the sermon series summary. And no, it's not a mistake. We put two in there intentionally because one is for you to keep, uh, to put it on your refrigerator as we go through the season of Lent together. And the second one is for you to invite someone to church, to use it to say, hey, we're talking about miracles this Lent season. Why don't you come join us for nine o'clock for 1030? Uh, this is for you to use to invite someone to church. This is a time where things are opening up again. Thanks be to God and that people are coming together again. We want people to be welcomed back to the church to join us for worship. So please uh, take advantage of those two uh, inserts during this time. Uh, are there any other announcements to be made this morning? All right, well, I want to, before we do, I know we're very excited for the children's chat, but I uh, just wanted to take a time to thank all of you who uh, give regularly to support the ministry of our church. Uh, now, uh, God commands us in the scriptures to, to tithe. What is a tithe? Tithe is a spiritual discipline, much like prayer, much like reading the scriptures, of giving 10% of your uh, income to the ministry of your local church. And this is a practice that people are invited to come into. And by doing so, we are able to be uh, God's hands and feet to our hurting community and our world. So for those of you who do practice tithing, I want to say thank you. Thank you for giving, for supporting the ministry of Wesley United Methodist Church. Uh, there are three ways that you can give. Uh, you can give by uh, giving us, a, putting a check in an envelope, putting it in the uh, 
uh, plates in the back. If you're joining us online, you can mail a check to 1500 Plainfield Avenue, South Plainfield, New Jersey, 07080. You can give online at wumcsp.org give. You could also uh, give using the Tithely app. That's T-I-T-H-E-L-Y. And that's the way that I give. I love to give that way because it gives me a record of all the gifts I have. I could set up reoccurring giving. It's a very easy way to remain faithful to God's commandments. So those who give, thank you. Uh, let's take a moment to just pray over the offering together. Will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for your love and your grace. And we thank you for the ways that you have supplied uh, every good and perfect gift during this difficult time. Lord, uh, we give just a little portion back uh, to you. Lord, we, I, I'm reminded of the widow's might. Even a penny can be a blessing to the kingdom. We thank you for the ways that you have given to us. And Lord, this gift, may you bless it. May you multiply it like the five loaves and two fish to feed your people, to serve your community to help our hurting world. Lord, glory be to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please remain seated as we sing our responsive hymn, I Surrender All. parts. <clears throat> the first part you can find in the New Testament on page 33 of your pew Bible. It's Mark chapter 1, verses 35 to 39. A preaching tour in Galilee. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found them, him, they said, Everyone is searching for you. 
he answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message, message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Our second reading can be found on page 187 of the New Testament, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, pressing toward the goal. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have obtained, attained. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So today we are concluding our sermon series titled Worthy. And as we begin, I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come here today to get to know you more just a little bit. Your word is true. So may you speak. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds to receive the word you have for us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So growing up as a child of an immigrant, I unfortunately didn't really have a relationship with my grandparents. They were the folks that we'd call on holidays, like uh, ha ha we would wish them a happy Thanksgiving, uh, happy New Year. The calls were always awkward because at the time I spoke very little Korean. And uh, they were also very, very short because international calls were expensive. And so it would be, hello, how are you? Merry Christmas, stay healthy, goodbye. Right? <laughs> I actually didn't even know the names of my grandparents until much later in life. Now back in 2019, uh, my dad came to visit from Korea uh, because he was speaking at a conference at Drew University. And many of you who have been here for a while remember that visit because my dad came and he baptized Amy, who was four years old at the time. Well, when I went to go pick up my dad at the airport, something amazing happened. Take a listen. Now, this interaction was fascinating to me because other than a brief interaction when Amy was about nine months old, she had never physically met her grandfather. So how was this able to happen? Well, at the time, Amy was talking to her grandfather in Korea on video chat about two to three times a week. So. She had something that I never had growing up. She had a relationship with her grandfather. She had a relationship with her uh, grandparents who lived in Korea. And she had a genuine connection relationship with them. It's no secret that the pandemic has changed everything about our lives. And we've especially witnessed the exponential expediting of technologies. 
All right? Uh, experts say that within the first six months of the pandemic, we saw an acceleration of the digitization of our society by about five years. Right? Churches had to go digital and online, as did schools and hospitals and uh, courtrooms had to figure out how to do court online. All kinds of businesses went digital. And of course, with the exponential increase in the use of technology in our lives, so has increased the amount of time that the average American spends in front of a screen. Now, on one side of the arguments, and you've heard me talk about this a lot, the overuse of things like social media uh, has a direct correlation with low self-esteem in young teenagers, and also with uh, extremism in terms of ideology in adults. Overuse of these technologies and services have led to a decline in overall self-image and self-worth. There are real dangers that come with the territory. However, there is another side to the coin. Screen time for four-year-old Amy meant having a meaningful and life-giving relationship with her grandfather who lives on the other side of the globe, a relationship that she would not have otherwise, a relationship I didn't have with my grandparents growing up. There is a potential added good that screen time brings to our lives. It can, in some cases, actually lead to the flourishing of a sense of worthiness of love and of life-giving relationships. So this experience that I had really had me thinking a lot about screen time, right? We are aware of the added harm that these new technologies bring, but there is also added good. So how do we live our lives in this balance? How do, where is the line? And how does uh, modern psychology and science inform uh, how we might view these tech new technologies? And how do the scriptures inform us on what is the most God-honoring and life-giving way to engage with our screens. Specifically in today's reading, we learn from Jesus' way of life that there is, in fact, a choice. We can either be driven by distraction or driven by a mission. We can either be driven by distraction or driven by a mission. So uh, the Gospel of Mark, where we read from today, is perhaps the earliest of the Gospels to be written. I know it's the second Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but uh, historically, Mark was the earliest Gospel to be written, and it's also the shortest. It's only 16 chapters. If you say, hey, this Lent, I want to read the Bible, I want to read a Gospel, choose Mark. You could be done with it in about 30 minutes or so, from, cover, from beginning to end. It goes straight to the point that Jesus is the Messiah. Every story in the Gospel of Mark is there to point to the fact that Jesus is Lord. It's not out to tell every story about Jesus' life, just enough to convince you that he is Lord. So today we read from Mark chapter 1. And at this point, Jesus had just begun his ministry. And he called some of his first disciples. He has about four of them at this point, And he begins preaching the good news and heals all who are sick. And Jesus is going viral very quickly. A crowd begins to form and follow after him. But then watch this. Let's read together verse 35. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. The deserted place is what in Greek? Eremos, right. Eremos, right. We've been talking about this for weeks on end. Uh, Eremos. The place of solitude, the one-on-one -on -one place with God, right? I love this, that even Jesus needs time alone with God. Jesus never said, hey, I'm way too busy for my devotional time. I'm way too busy to spend time in prayer. If you read through the Gospels, in fact, Jesus, he was too busy not to pray. He was too busy not to spend time with God. What do I mean by this? See, we think economically that time spent praying or time spent with God, time spent reading the Bible is less time sleeping, right? Less time getting our work done, so that means less productivity. 
But God's economics work differently. Carving out time alone with God every day helps you to declutter your thoughts, to calmly rethink situations that may not be as urgent as you thought before. It gives you time to forgive the people in your life that may need forgiving. It gives you time to perhaps forgive yourself. This one-on-one time with God. For me, my morning devotion time is critical. Uh, if uh, It sets the tone for the rest of my day. Those of you who do devotional time regularly every morning know what I'm talking about. Those days I forget to do devotional time, and I say, oh, I have so much to do, and I rush right into my to-do list. I often am messy with my work. That day I end up saying things I don't mean to say. I do the wrong thing at the wrong time. I'm prone to mistakes. I'm prone to overthinking things. The Eremos is where Jesus spends time with God and becomes laser-focused on his mission. So, Scripture says that while Jesus is in the Eremos, spending time with God, people are hungry for Jesus. Let's read the next verses here together. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. I like to read this last part with my teeth. Like, everyone is searching for you, Jesus. Embedded in this statement by Simon is a veiled rebuke. Like, Jesus, why are you spending time with God alone when you should be out there, right? Simon, Jesus, uh, Simon Peter is implying that Jesus has erred by seeking time alone in prayer. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? There will be plenty of time uh, to pray later, but there are people here who are eager to see you. Your ministry is new. Opportunities like this don't come all the time. You can pray tomorrow. Everyone is searching for you. Get out of your alone time. Come do what you're supposed to do, Jesus. How does Jesus respond? Let's read together verse 38. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. What is Jesus' response? No. What? Yeah, let's go. So, heal people here? No. Actually, we need to go over there. Right? There's people here that are wanting to hear from you, that want healing from you. Jesus says, no, actually, we have to go over there. Now, early on in my faith journey, I didn't really understand this. Like, why would Jesus say no to people who are seeking healing over here? I didn't understand this until I had children. Now, before I had kids, uh, I, was, I did whatever I thought was good right in front of me. Say, oh, this is good. Let's do it. Let's do that. I just did whatever I wanted to whenever I wanted to that I thought was good. But once I had kids, I realized that I wasn't able to do that anymore, that there was always a um, relational opportunity cost, if you will, at risk. So if I wanted to stay in the office to work on this project after hours so that I could make it really, really good, That meant less time with my children at home and investing in their upbringing, right? That if I said yes to one good thing, I am saying no to another good thing. When you start paying attention a bit too much to what everyone has to say, there is always something that you aren't doing. Isn't that true? It must have been especially so for Jesus, right? There was always something Jesus wasn't doing. He was fully divine, but still fully human. So he was limited in what he's able to do in a certain time. When he is uh, teaching over here, he's not healing the people over there. When he's feeding the people here, he's not preaching over there. But Jesus wasn't bothered by this. He knew that he had only certain things he's able to do at a certain time. Instead, Jesus is saying to Simon Peter, there are many, many good things that we can do. 
it doesn't mean that it is the best thing to do. For instance, when we think about screen time, right? Screen time, initially, in its immediacy, it's a biological positive. You know, the bright screen, the instant gratification, the notifications that are built into the interfaces of social media, they make us feel really good. There's, there's, um, it induces hormones like dopamine and endorphins that are associated with pleasure and reward, right? It does make us feel better. But constant long-term exposure to um, endorphins and dopamine, if you have dopamine over and over again for a long period of time, this is actually associated with brain disease, heart issues, schizophrenia, other mental issues. That dopamine over and over and over again is actually not good for us. So while screen time can be a short-term positive, it can potentially lead to long-term distraction and harm. It must come with healthy boundaries and at times being able to say no to a good thing. And so the life of a Christ follower is not about saying yes to every good thing that comes our way. But Christ here models for us being able to say no to good things so that we can say yes to the best things. I've said this here before, right? Christ models for us to say no at times to good things so that we can say yes to the best things. If you are driven by distraction, then regardless of whether it is a screen or whether it is even the people that are right in front of you, if you let every ping, every call, every cry, every notification, every veiled rebuke from assignment in your life dictate the way you live your life, you will always be driven by distraction. You will find yourself doing lots and lots of kind of good things, but then not having much to show for at the end of it all. There is a better way. What is Jesus' reasoning for saying no to healing the people that are here and instead to go to a neighboring town? What is his reasoning? For that is what I came out to do. For that is what I came out to do. Jesus knew his time on earth was short. Though he was fully divine, he's also fully human. Mysteriously, infinity is limited in a finite human. The human limitations of time, energy, hunger, fatigue, etc. There's only so much Jesus can do in those three years he has left before going to the cross. So he had to be focused on his purpose. So he had to say yes to only the best things, to say yes to the God things. Jesus knew his mission. In Mark chapter 1, 14 and 15, uh, earlier in this chapter, right after being baptized by John the Baptist and then coming out of the wilderness, uh, facing the devil for 40 days, uh, the first thing Jesus does is he begins his three-year ministry doing this. Let's read this together. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus' mission was to proclaim the good news, that the kingdom of God is near. A kingdom that will not just free a few people in the Middle East right now from their sickness, but will actually free the whole world, all of humanity, across time and space, from the power of sin and death, to liberate them from oppression, to liberate them from blindness, and give them life to the full. Jesus is saying no to the healing of a few here so that he can say yes to accomplishing his mission to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God is near. Jesus was able to distinguish the distractions from his mission. So church... What is our mission? Does anyone know what the mission statement of the United Methodist Church is? Oh, come on. You know this. What is the mission statement of the United Methodist Church? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. All right. For, the, yeah, right. <laughs> For those of you who didn't hear, let's read this together. 
The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The church exists to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to share the gospel, to, to train apprentices, right? This is the language we used back in January, right? Those who will follow the way of life that Jesus lived, a life full of compassion, of love, of hope, of healing, of feeding the hungry, for looking out for the least of these, to live a life of simplicity that says no to the distracting materialism marked with hurry and worry, and, that, and a life that says yes to the mission to bring more people into the fold of Christian being and living, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Because if more lived like Christ, there would be no more war. Amen? We'd have healing in the midst of pain. We'd have peace in the midst of suffering. We'd have hope in the midst of despair. We'd have a love that never ends. If more lived like Christ, it would transform the world. This is our mission. Now, at Wesley United Methodist Church, at our local church, we've narrowed down the definition of a disciple of Jesus to be someone who does three things. A disciple of Jesus is someone who knows God through participating in weekly worship, who grows together through engaging in small groups and being in groups together and, and uh, fostering community, and three, serves the world through various local and global mission opportunities to serve our community. A disciple is someone who knows God, who grows together and serves the world. The greatest purpose in your life is to know God to grow together and serve the world. Can we say this together? Know God, grow together, and serve the world. And we believe that if more people live this way, it would change the world. Now, this is our mission. This is our focus. The methods, the practices, the things, and the systems of our church all serve our mission. For example... So, church, I'm so excited that we're back in the building together. There's nothing like the corporate gathering of believers. Amen? Amen. Right? There's nothing quite like it. But we are not in the building maintenance business. Right? That means that the building is also a means. It is a method. It is a means that exists to serve our mission. It is a means to serve our mission. We are in the disciple-making business. And so this building, it exists to serve our mission. It actually serves our discipleship pathway, right? Number one, know God. This building exists to allow people to come together and participate in weekly worship to God. It allows us to come together and encounter God, to get to know God. We invest in the upkeep of this sanctuary because this place, this sanctuary, exists to help people get to know God. And next, this building exists to allow people to gather together in small groups, in Bible studies, uh, whether it's the Stephen ministers that meet here or the groups that meet here to put sandwiches together, right? To gather together in the presence of spiritual friends, to sharpen our faith. And this building exists to help people to grow together in their faith. And lastly, this building exists to allow people to serve the world. That's why putting that refrigerator in assembly hall, right, was a no-brainer. Obviously, because this building exists to allow disciples to come together and serve our community and our world. And we're like, oh, so, you know, we, we brought to the trustees, they're like, yeah, how much? And we got it done, right, Mike? Right? Because this building exists to allow us as disciples to serve the world, to know God, to grow together, and serve the world. This building is a blessing it is a gift that allows us to accomplish our mission. But let's say the building were no longer to serve our mission. Let's just say that sometime something happens 
And for some reason, the building begins to become a distraction to our mission. That all of us start to get so worked up about how certain rooms have to look or how the colors of the wall have to be exactly this way. This all is important. But let's say that begins to consume our conversations and take us away from the mission. If that were to ever happen, we need to be ready to sell the building. Because we must be ready to say no to distractions so that we can say yes to the mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, to lead people to know God, to grow together and serve the world. If the building is distracting us from that, we must be ready to sell the building. Now, we are not there. The building is a blessing to our mission. Amen? Amen. But remember, it is a means to serve our mission. Now take another look at this discipleship pathway. Know God, grow together, serve the world. When it comes to screen time, screens can be seen as a good or as an evil. Some of you say, technology is amazing, it's great. Some of you say, you know, right? <laughs> Away with technology, right? It's the evil. Maybe it's just a method. Maybe it's just a means. Perhaps we are called not to live away from the screen or in the screen, but beyond the screen. What do I mean by this? Let me ask you this. Can a disciple of Jesus Christ be made and nurtured strictly online? Can screens serve our mission? Yes? yes? How many of you say yes? Yes. I see a lot of hands. Yes. And if you're joining us online, I hope you're raising your hand because <laughs> this, right? Many of us are, many of our, uh, of our church family are joining us on live stream. We have 26 IP addresses joining us right now online. You are joining us in corporate worship, singing together, hearing the, the scriptures read and studied, right? You are getting to know God. We have Zoom small groups in our church. Small groups that meet online, they study the word together, they share life together, they carry each other's burdens, they are growing together. And then serves the world. You know, when it came time for me to go to Kenya uh, last fall, someone contacted me who had never set foot in our church before. And this person said, you know, I've been watching you online, I've been, you know, following you, I've been joining your church. And I'm so moved by what you all are doing at Nayagita. I, I want to donate. I, wanna, I have a whole bunch of school supplies. Can you take it with you? And I said, actually, we might have some room. Yeah, I will. And so with the hygiene kits that we had already prepared, we also had a lot of school supplies, pencils and notebooks that we were able to take to the school. Now, again, this, per this is a person who never set foot in the building of our church. And yet, through joining us online, they got to know God. They grew in their faith together with us such that they were moved then to serve their Kenyan neighbors on the other side of the world. Right? Someone became a disciple of Jesus Christ online. They encountered and experienced and got to know God. They grew in their faith together and they serve the world. Yes, a disciple of Jesus can be made through screen time. So the, so the true discussion is not whether someone is in the building or not in the building. The true discussion is not whether someone is on their screen or never using technology. We ought not be fixated on the moral value of a method because the best, me the best methods without a mission is but a distraction. The true discussion is this. We can be driven either by distraction or by a mission. We can either be driven by a distraction or driven by a mission. So church, what is your choice? You need to ask yourself, will I live a life driven by distraction? That is just getting up in the morning and starting to just do whatever comes to mind or whatever someone expects of me to do or Will I live a life driven by a mission? To start each day in the Eremos, to pause, to breathe, 
and to ask, God, what is the mission that you have for me today? What is the mission statement, God, that you have over my life? And then what steps are you leading me towards that mission today? Because when you know your mission, you will have a clear direction. When you know your mission, then the buildings and the screens in your life will no longer sway how you feel about your spiritual life or yourself. You will simply be, they will simply be methods and means that drive your mission forward. Let's forget about whether to live away from the screen or into the screen and instead begin living beyond the screen, focused on our mission, making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world and seeing God change the world. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your mission for the church, for us to know God, to grow together and serve the world. We thank you, Lord, for this building that serves to help us know God, grow together and serve the world. We thank you, God, for technology, for our streaming services, for our screens that allow us to know God, grow together, and serve the world. Lord, this is your mission for us. Forgive us of the times we made it something else. Forgive us, Lord, of the times we made our faith about ourselves. Lord, you long for us to grow in our faith, to get to know you more, to grow together in our faith work with our communities, and to serve our neighbors and the world. So Lord, help us to be liberated from distractions and Lord, to live into your mission, to live beyond the screens and into your future of peace in this world. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please rise and join us in singing our closing hymn, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Let there be peace. And now receive the blessing. Go, children of the most, recipients of the greatest love this world has ever known, being liberated from the distractions and driven by the mission to know God, to grow together, and to serve the world. Share that amazing good news of great joy with our neighbors and with the world in the name of the one who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen and amen. Amen.